Brian White is here. Boy, do I have questions for you, Brian. Boy, I have questions. But first of all, you're going to be where this coming week? This coming Saturday, October 26th in uh, St. George, Utah, there is a big Tesla event. It is a light show, also a light show competition, but also there will be live speakers there like myself and Will from Tesla Jigsaw and Simon Pollock from the light shows and others. It's going to be a, a big bunch of fun. Come on out and join us, St. George, Utah, the place where... You can also dine at a Chuckarama buffet. I mean, it's. I don't go. think that's on the sign, but it should be. Well, will 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 uh, 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 Mr. Trump will president ex President Trump be uh, serving burgers or making fries? I haven't asked. I'll check. Okay. <laughs> but if you love him, assume that the answer is yes. And if you hate him, assume that the answer is no. And I will see you in St. George. All right. Well, in a kind of a slightly, as you said, quasi-moto way, I have a quasi-political <laughs> question for you. Uh -oh. Will or will not Elon Musk be at the call on Wednesday afternoon, or will he be out someplace on a stage pumping Trump? Oh boy, that's a great question. You know, he told us, what, years ago now, I'm going to be on the calls less and less. And since then, he has been on every call. Right. So it is my default assumption that he would be on the call. Does he need to? No. The company is in very capable hands. At Investor Day last year, we got to see the lineup, the full bench of all the people who actually run each department, each division, um, and understand their presentation, their competencies. Does he need to be there? No, but he hasn't needed to for years so I don't know. He may think of this as too pivotal a moment to let pass. Um, so I don't, I think that's a great question. I'm going to say he will be on the call, even if he is on the call from some other location, because the call's not that long. He knows all the answers. Um, it's like when I join you next Friday uh, or next Monday okay. from uh, St. George, Utah yeah, or yeah. Nevada, Vegas, Nevada, where I would probably be. If you guys are in Vegas and want to hang out, I can do that after uh, the weekend. So I'll be there for another day or two. Actually, if, ex, extra cool. All right. Speaking of the call, the thing yeah. that before the call is, of course, the earnings report. And I know that you, I don't, you, you no longer make any guesses with regard to the numbers, but we've had James Cat came out this morning at fifty-eight cents. Mm -hmm. Um, AJ confirmed 50 cents, which was his number a couple of weeks ago. He says, yep, that's still his number. The highest I've seen is 66. We haven't heard. Uh, I think um, uh, Larry said he is higher than AJ, <laughs> but he didn't <laughs> give us a number. Where's Wall Street at? Do you know that? Because Wall Street is apparently also at exactly the same as uh, as James Cat, 58. Now, it depends on which Wall Street. So, of course, of course, there there is a widespread. There are people who I'm sure are much too high and much too low, or at least much higher and lower than the average. Of course, that's how averages work. I don't mean to be mean. It's just my mode. Yeah. There's a, a median here somewhere. We'll figure it out. But there's a lot to be said about Wall Street when it comes to predicting earnings. They're generally very good. The thing that they often miss is things like deferred uh, revenue from Megapack. Right. We've, we've seen some blowouts on that. That could easily be much lower or much higher because tracking deployments is a lot more complicated. Right. It can be done. I just don't think anyone is doing it because beyond the quarter, it really doesn't matter. It's a longer-term play. Then you've got things like, I made a video last week about counting more of the FSD revenue. Did yeah. you catch that one? I and didn't catch it, but I get the concept. The concept is uh, they changed the verbiage of FSD back in March to it is what you are purchasing is not FSD someday. What you're purchasing is supervised today. On all new sales, you count that revenue. On all subscriptions, you count that revenue. And for a limited time only, you can transfer your FSD that you already have. From beta to supervise, we count that revenue. So there isn't, you know, it's not going to be a huge cash bomb, but there's also the fact that they've been only counting a percentage yes. and that percentage is still increasing as it, as the feature gaps close. So there's some upside to be had on FSD. 
whatever Wall Street is at, I'll take the over by a penny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which is go. which is my honest answer. I've tried modeling huh. for revenue and earnings in the past, mm -hmm. and no matter how I model it, it falls up. It doesn't work. Right. Um, I thought that was flaws in my methodology. What I didn't realize is, of course, it falls apart. That's how these models work. Uh, they're meant to not work uh, because it is too impossible to predict on a company with as many product lines in as many countries as this. It's all throwing darts. And I'm too honest to throw darts. If I don't have a if I don't have a model that works, I'm not going to present something as fact. Precisely, exactly my position as well, which is why I've given up the game. Um, mm -hmm. So we also have uh, the question of how the stock acts. I made a comment this morning uh, where I said I wouldn't be at all surprised. I think the stock is just as likely to go to 188 as it is to go to 265 in the short term, meaning the next quarter. And that it probably doesn't matter because once we get well into two, once we get into twenty sixty, once we get into twenty twenty five, it's all over. We're going to the moon. So, so what do you think about my theory? A lot of times we see buy the rumor, sell the news. What we have not seen on this particular earnings is a buying of the rumor. The stock has not run up in advance of earnings, meaning the downside is less. It doesn't go away. It's still there. There wasn't a big run up to 1010. A lot of times those are buy the rumor, sell the news. Those were don't buy the rumor or sell the rumor, but definitely sell the news. Wall Street did not see what they were looking for. And that's fine. 5% here, 8%. It's fine. That's not a big swing. That's not, we've seen the stock swing that much on no news. <laughs> so I'm not concerned about that. What you said about 2025 and beyond is correct. You can love or hate a stock all you want. That can only bolster it for so long. That can only keep it down or keep it up for so long. At some point, the fundamentals prevail. And the fundamentals are Megapack, uh, the likely upcoming intermediate compact, but really it's the bot, and dojo, and autonomy, and robotaxi. All that is is the ticking time bomb of revenue that we are staring down the barrel of to mix as many metaphors as I can. And they are uh, at every time you and I and any of our guests have modeled things like Optimus. What we do is we look at it and our job is to say, are their numbers too high, too low, or just right? And every time we say, boy, your assumptions are much too conservative. And they say they are. But when I put them where I think they actually are, the, the end number is beyond insane. It's like, well, so you've already cut, you've already assumed the production will cost twice as much as we know it's gonna. And you've assumed that the revenue is going to be half what we know it's gonna. And it still consumes every atom dedicated to cash in the known universe in 10 years. So it's, uh, even if the worst case scenario happens, it's still going to be very good. All right, let's take it apart. Let's start with Juniper. Mm -hmm. We had the rumor mongering over the weekend that Juniper is right now at this very moment beginning to roll through Shanghai uh, in terms of a closed loop um, uh, production uh, at some very low numbers, 12, 15 a day, something like that. Um, walk us through, if that's true, how will we know, when will we know? And then walk us through what happens from closed loop to full beginning of the ramp and when sales actually begin. I don't know what they mean by closed loop. I assume it has to do with a misunderstanding of what was said to them. This is a single source rumor. It's only on one website and a handful of people who said, according to, mm -hmm. uh, so I don't put any faith in it until you know how I am with single source rumors. They're not my jam. It's plausible. It is plausible that pre-production has begun. Um, but it is not, you know, it's still 2024 and we heard not until 2025. Would it surprise me that they start a month and a half early in Shanghai? Not really. 
So what does the loop mean? When I had a chance to see the factory in Fremont, I asked them how many lines are building the Model Y. And he said, lines isn't the right word. It, he said it's more of a circle. So I think that's what they're referring to is that mm. the manufacturing system isn't a line per se. And I tried 20 analogies to say, is it this? Is it a river that widens? Is it an octopus? What are we talking about? And all of them, he's like, no, it's more of a, like a circle. I'm like, this is very helpful and informative. Thank you so much for telling me less, <laughs> but uh, that's their job and they're very good at it. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean? We've already seen vehicles on the road testing the timeline is right if it's not out in one of the factories or more during q1 at the latest i'd be very surprised so the the timing's right everything looks right um i've seen a number of people speculating oh it's going to be 48 volt it's going to be steer by wire drive by wire whatever it's going to be brake by wire. guys it's going to be the model 3 refresh but a model y that's what it's going to be. Parts commonality is critical. They're going to do that. So they're going to need to, uh, yeah, just, and once they do that, I think we can expect to see sales jump a little bit again. At the very least, we're going to see a lot of Model Ys hitting the secondary market as people upgrade to the new hotness, yeah. especially people who bought early Model Ys that, mm -hmm. real, that, are, that have already been thinking about getting one. At the same time, we're seeing interest rates come down. The definitely going to happen recession appears to have not happened. And uh, things are going reasonably well in the mark, in the economy. Uh, and if someone told you an, a recession was definitely happening, um, take their next prediction with a grain of salt. Oh, no, you see what you just did. <laughs> I don't. I continue to say that the recession is in has, has started in June and continues today. Now, it may turn out. I, I've, I've, I've caveated recently that it may turn out that the tech industry, the government, and the medical industry combined might have saved the rest of the industries. In other words, it may have saved the, the reality of going into the red in terms of GDP. But the rest of the everybody else, housing, transportation, um, auto, how, you know, uh, small business, Etc. Those are already in recession and have been in recession for a couple of years. So mm -hmm. we have two economies. And the question is, did one of them, was one of them strong enough to keep the other one from uh, pulling everything into an actual negative GDP? So just so, so, so that's been my position for quite a long time. Yes, but you know that I don't listen to the things that that Randy Kirk fella says. <laughs> so then next would be the cyber cab a huge hullabaloo over the charging method. So how do we charge the cyber cab with this lousy induction? Uh, two bit, half baked, come right. on. So I've got a, a number of answers. I had a chance to talk with a friend of mine yesterday. Lightning Ryan was uh, uh, in town. He came down for, we were going to install some running boards on his truck, but it was pouring down rain. So we just did an FSD drive and talk tech. Uh, Ryan's a, a fantastic tinkerer. He made his own hydrogen fuel cell once just to see if he could uh, back, you know, in the, in the day he, he, he drove down to LA to rent an EV one just cause he wanted to when it was a thing. So one of the things we talked about was charging and of course, MKBHD made a video, Marquez Brownlee, a very respected tech blogger where he missed a bunch of stuff. He just You're missed getting it. Less and less respected. Well, the problem is everyone around him is getting smarter and he's still trying to be the master of all. And uh, you can't master all the traits. When he made his video about CyberCab, he missed a, a handful of fundamental Tesla issues that watching it as people who follow it as closely as you and I do, we're just looking at it going, what you, okay. So you should have had an expert with you to fact check you because it, 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 diminishes your credibility. Uh, if the cyber cab has only inductive charging, it is not limited to 20 kilowatts. There are systems that already go to 100, 120 kilowatts, but even at 20 kilowatts, the battery is so small, it'll charge in no time flat. Mm. Will it have a charge port? I bet it will. Mm. It's not, it's probably an extra 50 bucks a cost. They might put it in the trunk 
mm. like behind the be, like behind a flap or something. We're still very early in the design. It does not add substantial complexity or cost to add an additional method of charging. And that charger might be limited at 20 kilowatts mm. just because then the hardware required is so much cheaper. Gotcha. So the charging issue is a non-issue. And the beauty of the inductive charging is, unlike a supercharger, which is quite expensive to build, right. the inductive pad is very compact, maybe a few hundred bucks at scale. Yeah. And you can deploy them anywhere you have ground. <laughs> you don't need to dig. All you need is a 220 plug nearby and you're going to get, you know, uh, 20 amps, 50 amps. I mean, you're going to get whatever you need in terms of level two charging, which, and I've seen people say, well, the battery's too small. It's never going to work. They can't charge fast enough. It's going to be a disaster. Hey, I don't know of a market that doesn't have peaks in the demand during the day. Right. And in between uh, the peaks are valleys, valleys of demand. That's when you charge my friend. It doesn't need to last 24 hours or three days. It needs to last one rush hour. Right, right, right. Okay, switching to Cybertruck production. How sure are we that this is currently one shift, one line? Because a bunch of people mm. have questioned my mm. analysis, which may or may not have been something you agreed with. Um, and, and if it is only one shift, one line, how will we know when they go to two shifts or to two lines? That was the question that was brought up. Very good questions. I did agree with you that it was one shift, one line. I hadn't yet seen anything that would suggest otherwise. The only thing I'm seeing that would suggest otherwise is volume is doing very well. Mm -hmm. So maybe they have just increased the line speed, which is very possible, or they have increased the shifts. Worth mentioning that a lot of the things that go into it, you could have more shifts already going on things like uh, stamping and bending, breaking, and they could those could already be at more than one shift with the actual assembly being at one. So the parts that would still mean that you could never get, you couldn't easily scale to three, four shifts, but you could still have a tremendous volume on two shifts or, or less than full 24 seven production. How will we know when it happens? <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. I suppose the easy way would be for Joe Tegmeyer to go in and fly <laughs> during darkness second. hours during second shift and see if anything's happening. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, we had a, a very, very important report. I mean, it's unbelievable to me that the stock is stuck right now because we not only had the rumor over the weekend, but last week we had DHL come out and mirror Pepsi's statement. And DHL is not only a big factor here in the United States, but they're a huge factor in Europe. And you did a little reporting on this the other day. What do we think about what's going to be happening with DHL and semi in Europe? Well, first of all, if you want to ship a parcel to Pyongyang, DHL is the only carrier that can get it there. So that's not worth nothing. Okay. So that's just a side note. Uh, the, when semi originally was announced, they said it's going to have 500 miles of range. People said, yeah, 500 miles of Tesla range. What's the real range? And what I've always said is, these are commercial buyers. They don't tolerate EPA shenanigans. They don't care what you can test it at. They want to know what it's actually rated at. Because it doesn't matter what's what it says on the sticker. If I wind up 10 miles short of my hub and out of juice, I'm never buying a truck from you again. So when it gets out into real world testing, what DHL found was fully loaded. It's getting over 500 miles. 500 miles is the realistic guess, uh, but there will be applications where it goes over and ones where it goes under. That's what commercial buyers require. What this means is it's ready for prime time. There are very few. Uh, the majority of routes do not require more than 500 miles of range. Uh, the, the slowdown I expect to see, and not necessarily a slowdown, but the bottleneck I expect to see at this point is commercial customers having access to sufficient juice at their depots to keep these babies running. If I own a mom and pop shop and I have two trucks, I probably have enough power to keep one of them on the road 40 hours a week. Mm. Uh, I might have enough juice to keep two of them on the road 40 hours a week, but over that, 
No. And certainly not 24 seven. The, the, the amount of juice I would need at the, at the depot is an amount that very few mom and pop shops would have no matter, no matter what business they're in. It's right. a lot. So that's going to be a holdup. There's a years long backlog of transformers. If you yeah. order a big transformer now, it's probably two, three years. And that doesn't mean we're out. That means almost everybody keeps extras. If you look at a, a satellite view of any power plant, you will find somewhere on the property is a little area where they're storing spares mm -hmm. because they can't wait two, three years. They have to have extras on hand. Hopefully we will get to a point where the backlog is short enough that people don't feel the necessity to hoard them because it's the hoarding that's exacerbating the problem. And then you've got AI companies wanting to fire up AI data centers who are ordering transformers today in the belief that they will have an AI data center in a year or two or three. Mm. And if those all come to pass, they, they will have been wise to do it. Okay. Um, what about the cost of CyberCab? How low can the cost of CyberCab go? I think you spoke to this. I did. I did. I did. So there's a misunderstanding. I think Elon said the cost could get as low as 20 cents a mile. He didn't say the price would get to 20 cents a mile. He the said the cost. And he also qualified it heavily. Out of the gate, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I ran them the other day. And I think we said conservatively, it would be as low as, and this is the highest guess, around 40 to 45 cents a mile. Counting depreciation. Uh, counting depreciate counting. Yes. Depreciation, counting, cleaning, counting tires, counting absolutely everything. Um, and with a price of 30,000, instead of 25, you drop the price by five grand, you're going to have more money. Right. Um, but that also negatively impacts your residual value anyway, starting and people say, well, no, no, it's, it's definitely going to be 20 cents a mile to drive. It's not, it's not, you still have to buy the car. And uh, it doesn't need to be 20 cents. Even at 45 cents, you could, you know, spend, you could charge a buck a mile and make a whole lot of money. Yeah. And even at two bucks a mile, I'm confident you would be under what Uber charges. At a buck 50 a mile, I would never drive to the airport again, ever. At two bucks a mile, I would only drive to the airport for short trips when parking would be, you know, prohibitive. Right. But, uh, but at a buck a mile, I mean, maybe I wouldn't own a car anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. I've already made the move. <laughs> yeah. All those things. I don't, I don't drive to the airport anymore because the, the daily parking rate around LAX is ridiculous. Astronomical. Yeah. Astronomical. And I might as well put it in a hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I mean, you joke, but <laughs> hotel rooms in Joshua Tree are cheaper than parking spots right. in L.A. That's exactly right. So, okay. And then what about the cost of the vehicle itself? You were talking about the ways that Tesla has taken cost out of the vehicle in based on what we saw at 1010. Uh, what were some of the more interesting things that you saw there? The one that I loved was, uh, you know, panel gaps. They're terrible. Everyone hates panel gaps. Well, Tesla's gotten around it by making better quality control. But what if you could engineer panel gaps out of the equation? So for example, the front lip hangs over slightly. That means that you would never notice a gap. The gap would be imperceptible. Um, the same with everything on the car. There are the lines that run through it are seldom contiguous. Uh, even in the interior where all the edges meet up. There's no lines that continue from panel to panel. So a mismatch would never be noticed. And they did this with everything. The shape of the hood is that way. The, the way the lights meet with the panels is that way. Hmm. All of it is ready for that. In terms of the materials, uh, the one we saw was Sandy Monroe speculated carbon fiber. Others speculated like a, like a fibrous ABS plastic, hmm. um, not terribly different in in terms of what they are you can make those very strong they're they're also very cheap they're also extremely fast to make they just you've seen how fast uh injected plastic is manufactured it's instant it's yes, seconds I, i've seen that yes you've seen it a time or two uh <laughs> you've seen the machines it just literally just pops out so so the materials are very very cheap but they designed around all the things there's no 
mirrors there's which means not only did you eliminate three physical objects but you eliminated all the wiring that goes to all of them all the design that goes into the wiring the validation for the harness the weight for the copper all of that's gone and then you look even at things like um the seats don't need to adjust the fact that it's not on rails that moves that that has motors that has controls it's just a seat. You don't hop on a bus and go, boy, where's my lumbar support? It's not a thing. Same with the movies. The movies don't have lumbar support. They just have seats. So when you install it, you just, it's just four bolts and you're done. You don't have to think about it. It moves very quick and everything is like that. Uh, and then the glass. Glass is heavy. Glass is expensive. This car has three pieces of glass. Hmm. Three. Uh, which is half of the next closest car on the market. Oh. Most cars have a minimum of five, often six, seven, eight or more because they'll have little corner pieces so that yeah. the windows can still roll down or, or second panels in the back because the door is too small for the rear windows to roll down. This has got a windshield, two sides and done. Yeah. So every part of it, it doesn't even have, it doesn't appear to have B pillars. The wall behind the passenger seat, uh, passenger compartment is a structural element that is cheaper than, than stamping and welding B pillars and just as strong. It does mean you can't tear it out and just turn it into a normal car with a hatch, but it's not designed to be that. All right. Well, very, very interesting. I could go on forever, but you can't. I can't. No. I have a very important meetings and appointments. Yes. In fact, one of those meetings or appointments would be to do Tuesday's show with me. And if we don't stop this one, how can we possibly start doing Tuesday? We literally cannot do that meeting until this one ends. And it's on my calendar. So I, I must go. We must go. We must go. It's been great talking to you, Brian. Everybody should go and visit with you in Las Vegas and are in um, St. George, Utah, St. George, Utah, which I considered at one time moving my company to St. George just to save $7,000 a month in electric bill. Wow. $7,000, $14,000 electric bill in Los Angeles would have dropped to $7,000 in St. George, not to mention how much the cost of renting the factory would have, have saved me. But but yeah, the electric bill would have dropped in half. Um, so they should come visit you in St. George this weekend and uh, or v Vegas on Monday. Is that about right? Something Sounds like right to me. Okay. All right. And for to all of you out there, it has been great talking to you.